When using a SQL database with your application, there are two patterns you should at least consider using. One is ORM, or Object Relational Mapping, and the other is automated schema migration. Luckily, Diesel provides both of these for Rust applications. In this video, we'll walk through the value Diesel provides and how to leverage it in your application. Make sure you stay until the end for some thoughts on productionizing with Diesel. Object relational mapping refers to automating the conversion between SQL structures and the structures of a higher level programming language, in our case, Rust. Doing this can eliminate the need to put SQL queries in your code, which can really make things a lot cleaner and less error prone. It's almost never the case that our database schema stays the same forever. As new features are added to the application, more tables and columns will likely need to be added as well. Manually adding these tables and columns can be tedious and error prone. Automated schema migration makes schema changes more testable, repeatable, and also reversible. Developers just need to write my migration scripts for each schema update, and then they can be confident that that change will be applied consistently across all environments and also will be reversible if there's a problem. In this example, we'll be using Diesel with Postgres SQL, but it also works with MySQL and SQLite. In this video, we're going to build RustFlix. So RustFlix allows us to manage users, videos, and views of those videos by those users. So we can do things like RustFlix video creates bad movie and then a title, and then a description, really bad movie. And it'll create that video. Behind the scenes, it's storing that to a SQL database. And then we can do RustFlix video show, and now we can see that video exists. One thing to note about Diesel is that it makes use of a command line application. Since we're working with Postgres, we'll actually need to install the libpq library before installing the Diesel CLI. So to do that, we're gonna do brew install libpq. Notice after the install completes, it shows some suggested values for the LD flags and CPP flags environment variables. Those are actually for C and C++ compilers. We're gonna actually set the Rust flags environment variable to the value that they suggest for LD flags. So we're gonna do export Rust flags equals, and then copy this value. When we actually install the diesel CLI, we don't want to worry about the MySQL or SQLite libraries. So we're actually gonna disable the default features and specify only the Postgres feature. Looks like that worked. Let's see if we can run the diesel CLI. Yep. So we kind of have the skeleton of the RustFlix application already set up. We have it parsing command line arguments. Now all we need to do is incorporate diesel and we want to be able to specify our database connection URL via an environment variable. So we're actually going to create a .env file in our package directory. And we're going to specify the database URL here. So if, as long as we use the .env crate, we can pull in this environment variable when our program starts. Before we do anything else with diesel, we need to run diesel setup. And diesel setup does two things. Number one, it reads that .env file, connects to Postgres, and will actually create our database. And also it creates the migrations directory in our project. Now let's talk about what a migration is in the context of automatic schema migrations. A migration is a unit of SQL that describes both how to apply and reverse a schema change. The diesel CLI can help us set up the file structure for a new migration. I can do diesel migration generate videos. So now the diesel CLI has set up the file structure for this new migration, and we can see it created a directory inside the migrations directory that's prefixed with a date time and then postfixed with what we named that migration, which in our case is videos. Migrations are run in chronological order as specified by the timestamps on the directory names. Beyond that, you can arrange migrations however you like. In my case, I'm gonna create actually a separate migration for each table that this application is gonna use. So I'm gonna have one for videos, one for users, and one for views. We're only gonna focus on videos for this video. You could, if you wanted to, you could potentially put all those table creations in one migration if you wanted, completely up to you. The important thing to note is that migrations are run chronologically based on when they're created. So as long as you don't have a migration that depends on something in a subsequent migration, you should be in good shape. Now let's look at our migrations directory. In each of these migrations, we have an up.sql and a down.sql, and the up.sql file will contain code for applying that schema migration. Down.sql will do the reverse. If we were creating a table in up. SQL will likely be dropping that table in down.sql. And this is what helps make these migrations repeatable and also reversible if there's a problem. And again, in RustFlix, we're going to create a migration for each of the tables that the application uses, but we'll focus on videos here because the concepts for users and views are basically the same. So in up.sql, we're going to do create table videos, ID serial, not null. So the DB is going to decide on the ID for each insert. 
So yeah, each video is gonna have an ID, a title, a description, and we're never gonna delete videos from the database because a view might reference a video that have, has been deleted, so we'd wanna keep it around. So we're gonna have a removed flag that's gonna be a Boolean. And of course, our primary key is gonna be the ID. And like I mentioned, in down.sql, this needs to undo everything that happens in up.sql. So we're just gonna do drop table videos. So that contains a self-contained migration that's reversible and repeatable. Now, if we wanna test running this migration on our database, all we need to do is diesel migration run, and that ran the video migration. So now we should see a table called videos at this point. Yep, nothing's in there, but it's the table's there. Now, if you wanna roll back the most recent migration, you can do diesel migration revert. And so we should see no table now. Yep, table doesn't exist. If you wanna verify that a migration is properly reversible, you can just do diesel migration redo, and that'll roll it back and then rerun it. And so if there are any problems with the rollback part, you'd get some errors here. One, one really important thing to note here is that if you're testing your migrations and you later decide, oh, I wanna add another field to this table, so I, I wanna add like stuff here. If you just run your migration again, it's not gonna do anything you're not gonna get this new field. Because as far as diesel is concerned, that migration has already been run and it doesn't need to be run again. So you actually need to redo that migration. And we can see now we have that extra column that we added. This is something that can definitely bite you when you're starting out with diesel or any other automated schema migration tool. The other thing that diesel migration run does is it generates schema.rs in your source directory, which is generated code that will allow you to interact with your tables in Rust. Now that we understand migrations, we're gonna look at cargo.toml. We're gonna add diesel as a dependency, as well as .env for reading environment variables, and also chrono for dealing with date times. In main.rs, we'll add some mod statements for some modules that we're gonna create. We're gonna create a DB module. Um, we're gonna add the schema module that was auto-generated for us. And we're gonna add a module called models. And we also need to add this uh, macro use macro create diesel. Now we're gonna create db.rs in our source directory, and that's gonna contain some kind of boilerplate code for establishing a connection to the database. We're gonna start off with some use statements the diesel prelude, uh, env for loading those environment variables, and standard env. We're gonna create one function in this file and it's gonna be called establish connection. And it's simply gonna connect to the database specified in the database URL environment variable and return a PG connection struct for that connection. We're gonna grab the database URL from the environment variable and then we're gonna establish a connection to it. And that should do it for db.rs. Now we're gonna create the models that we'll use to represent the video structure in our Rust code. We'll create a file called models.rs in our source directory. And we're gonna write a use statement to grab the videos structure that is in the auto-generated code in schema.rs. The structures in this file are gonna leverage some diesel macros that'll enable us to pass them into some of the diesel functions. The ones we're gonna use are queryable, which indicates that the structure can be used to perform lookups, and also insertable, which means the structure can be used to perform inserts. And the third one, which is a little bit less intuitive, is as change sets, which indicates that a structure can be used to perform updates on an object. And again, we're just gonna look at the structures for videos here. Users and views uh, use the same concepts. And we're actually gonna make two structures for videos. One is for inserting a video, because you don't need the ID when you're inserting a video since that's generated by the database. So that structure is gonna have all the fields except the ID field. As I mentioned, we're gonna derive the insertable macro and we have to use this diesel table name macro and refer to the table that this structure is meant to be inserted into. And the actual structure is gonna be struct new video and it's gonna use a lifetime annotation, which you'll see why in a second here. It's gonna have three fields, title, which is gonna have that lifetime description. And the reason this lifetime annotation is here is because title and description are string slice references. In order for this to compile, we need to verify that title and description have lifetimes at least as long as the new video struct. Otherwise, those fields would point to freed memory, essentially. So that's what this lifetime annotation is for. The next structure is gonna be used both for reading query results and also for updating videos. So we're gonna derive uh, debug queryable and as change set 
and the struct is going to be called video. Oops. And it's going to have four fields, ID. So this should be all we need to model to start interacting with that videos table in Rust. So we have this ops module with this video ops submodule, and we already have the function signatures for the functions we're gonna implement. The program is already parsing command line arguments and putting them into these structures that get passed to these functions. So all we need to worry about in this file is actually reading and writing from the database. There's a few use statements we need to add. We need to grab the models that we just created from the model module. And we need to grab that establish connection function that we created in db.rs. And then of course the diesel prelude. Now we can start implementing these functions. If you'd like more details on how the command line arguments are parsed into these structures here, uh, there's a video I'll link down in the description below that'll go over that. So first we're just gonna print some debug output to verify that the right thing got passed into this function. And in the auto-generated code in schema.rs, there's also a DSL or domain-specific language submodule for every table that we create. So we're gonna need to reference that in a use statement here. And then we're gonna call that establish connection function that we created in db.rs. We're gonna use that new video structure that we created in models.rs because this is gonna insert a video. And we're gonna populate it with the fields from create video, which is a structure that the command line arguments got parsed into. And at this point, we can actually perform the insert. Pass in the connection object that got returned by established connection. And now put this error if anything goes wrong. So that's all we should need for inserting a video. You can see we referenced the auto-generated code in schema.rs here using this videos structure. And then we passed in our new video model to the values function. And then we called execute and passed in the connection that we established. Fairly straightforward. Now onto update. This is gonna be pretty similar to create, but we're gonna be using that video structure instead of new video. Now we're gonna invoke the, the update function. And this is really cool. We can actually reference this videos.find function, which is in the generated code, and we can pass in the ID of the video that we wanna update. And then we say set, uh, because it's an update, pass in the connection, and if there's an error, output this message. Okay, that should do it for update. And last but not least, we're gonna implement show videos, which is actually gonna output all the videos in the videos table. The auto-generated videos structure has this filter function that allows us to filter out entries that we're not interested in. And in our case, we're gonna filter out anything where the removed field is true. So we reference that videos table in the auto-generated code, and we filter out any rows where removed is true. And then we call the load function, referencing the video structure that we created as a structure that we should read the results into. And then we're just gonna print the results. And that should do it, let's test it out. All right, let's build and test this. So let's do rust flicks video create dash help. So it says we need to specify a title and a description. Rust flicks video create good movie. Uh, description really create movie. Okay, it says we created the video. Rust flicks video show. Cool, let's see if it shows in the database. Yep, looks like it's there. Looks good. So I do have a few thoughts on working with diesel in a production environment. First, you probably don't want to use the .env file. You probably want to set the database URL environment variable using your CI/CD system. So you can have one environment for tests and another for production. The other thing is, recall that we had to run diesel setup and then diesel migration run. Ideally in production, we want these things embedded in our code so we don't have to install the diesel CLI on our production machine. Now, unfortunately, there isn't a programmatic equivalent to diesel setup, although there's some discussion about creating one.
but there is a programmatic equivalent to diesel migration run, which is in the embedded migrations module. You can call the run function. And this is nice because you can actually embed your migrations in your binary, so you don't have to deploy those separately. And then you can run them from your code every time your application starts. So it seems like right now, the idiomatic way to do things is to install the diesel CLI on your production image, run diesel setup before your application starts, and then call the embedded migrations run function to run any migrations that haven't yet been performed. So that's a quick run through of working with diesel. Let me know in the comments if you're interested in any other SQL crates and maybe how they compare to diesel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.